Good morning and welcome to the worship video for Bowersville Church of Christ for Sunday, May 10th, 2020. Today we want to both worship God and honor our moms. We know that every good thing in life is a gift from God and moms are among the very best of those gifts. So this morning we're going to begin with a video honoring our moms and encouraging them. That is going to be followed by a communion meditation. Communion, or the Lord's Supper, is a symbolic meal in which we remember Jesus' death and resurrection through consuming a piece of cracker, which represents his body, and some juice, which represents his blood. Followed by that reading of scripture, which can orient us towards that sacrifice, there's going to be a brief time for reflection and meditation. After that, there's going to be a sermon, and then we are going to be concluded with a prayer by Roger Howard. Uh, if you're at all blessed by this video, we encourage you to uh, go on Facebook and like us and follow us and share. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back. Mommy! Where are you going? Sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy! Mommy! Where are you? Mommy! Are you in there? Mommy! We can see you! Up and up! I just want to lie in the sun But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you would speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Uh... I love my mom because she's always there for me when I need her, whether it's to do homework or to cheer me up. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thanks for everything you do for us. We genuinely appreciate it and hope you have the best Mother's Day ever. Because you deserve it. We, we love, love you. you. There are many things I love about my mom. She is snuggly and cuddles with me. She's caring and loves us 24-7. I love my mom because no matter how tired she is or how long of a day she's had, she always buckles down and makes amazing meals for me and my family. I love my mom because she always believes in us no matter what and she works really hard so we can do the things that we enjoy doing. All right, Addie, can you tell me why you love mom? Uh -huh. I love my mom because she is sweet and kind and she loves us, but most of all because she loves Jesus. And I love why do you love mommy? 
because she plays hot potato with us at bedtime and she colors with us and she plays with us and and she makes oh, yummy oh. food in the most love because she loves Jesus a bunch. Lincoln, why do you love mommy? Because every time she puts chicken out of my food and I love her so much and when she leaves she draws pictures for me and I love her so much. All right, tell mommy you love her. Love you. Love you. Love you. So, Rochelle, what do you love about your mom? I love that she comes and supports all the stuff that I do and takes me to watch movies and uh, takes care of me when I'm sick and makes sure I have all the medicine that I need and that she makes me feel loved and special. What I love about my mom is she's always there for me when I'm sad and upset and she loves me and teaches me about Jesus. What I love about my mommy because she cuddles with me and she makes good cake and she teaches me about God. What I love about my mom is she's imaginative and creative and loves me too. But most importantly, she is a godly example towards me. Hey mom, I just wanted to say that I love you so, so much and that I really hope that you have an amazing, amazing Mother's Day. And I just want you to know that you are such an amazing mother. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. I love my mom because she's thankful for everybody and she gets stuff that I want and she makes sure that we have food, a house, and a place to sleep and stuff, and um, and she's grateful for everybody, and she takes care of everybody. Come on, we do that. As we prepare for communion meditation this morning on Mother's Day. I'll read from Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood, do the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink of this bread, drink, eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment upon themselves.
wish all the moms out there a happy Mother's Day. Mothers are tremendously important in our lives. And we know that Mother's Day is only one day out of the year, but we hope that moms feel loved and appreciated uh, for sure on this day. The Bible devotes an entire chapter to the importance of motherhood because it is so important. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31, in which a man praises his wife for the kind of wife and mother she is. In verse 10, he says, An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. Later in the chapter, he says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. As I reflect on these verses, I realize that I am extremely fortunate to myself have a mother who dedicated decades of her life to raising my three brothers and me. And we didn't always make it easy on her, that's for sure. There were times when we drove her to do what many moms in the 80s and early 90s did, and that's say, it's outside time. And we heard that door lock behind us because she just needed a break. And we sure weren't going to give it to her. But she made our home a place of comfort, warmth, and love. I'm also extremely blessed uh, with my wife, Jamie, who is an incredible mother to our three children. She makes sacrifices for them that they will not appreciate till years from now. They benefit from what a great listener she is. She prays with them, and she has always made sure that they connect with God. She's provided them age-appropriate material, uh, devotional material to know God every step of their life. Mother-in-law jokes are low-hanging fruit for ministers, and I've used them myself. Uh, some people use them because they ring awfully true for a lot of people, but for me it's just a joke because I'm blessed for, with my mother-in-law, Rosie, who not only helped raise my wife to be the incredible woman she is, but who has always treated me with generosity and love. So today I want to encourage moms with this idea. Biblical motherhood is disciple making. A mom's aim should be to be able to say to her kids the same thing that Paul said to the Corinthian church in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. A mom should be able to say, I am striving to be like Jesus and because I am striving to be like Jesus, you should become like me. This is a possible goal because moms are highly influential in their kids' lives. Children learn from their moms. They just don't learn skills. But they, more importantly, learn the kind of person that they should become. It's often easy to see the ways in which children are becoming like their parents by following the example they set before them. I clearly see some of uh, Jamie's best traits in my, in my own children. Micah, my son, oldest son, has a very tender heart. Lena and Jamie both are willing to admit when they are wrong. Now, both my girls are extremely stubborn, so they're not happy about it, but they do. Joshua is like Jamie in that he is an affectionate and outgoing people person. But sometimes the things in which uh, kids follow after their mom are these simple things, like these phrases that they use. Joshua, if he gets really frustrated with me, will raise up his arms in the air and say, Seriously? And after the first couple of times uh, he said that, I realized that's the exact phrase that his mom will use when someone has pushed her to the limits of her patience. And in this you see how mom and dad, and really all people teach, and that's through an example, primarily. Jamie never said to Joshua, hey Joshua, if you get really frustrated with your dad, just throw your hands up in the air and say, seriously? He saw that she used it when she gets frustrated, and he simply mimicked her. It is probably just a subconscious decision on his part, and Jamie, I was talking to her about this, and she didn't even realize how often she has to resort to using seriously until she heard Joshua start to use it too. We learn from example. Moms teach by example. And everyone knows that kids become who they are in large part from what they're teach, 
Parents teach them by examples they set. And we have different phrases to describe them. When it's positive, we say, well, he's a chip off the old block. But when it's less glowing, we'll say something like, the nut does not fall far from the tree. So we have to be careful about what gets passed along. I read a story about a mother and a little girl who were sitting, and the little girl was watching her mother do dishes. And she noticed in her mom's brunette hair a couple of silver hairs starting to fall. She asked, Mommy, why are some of your hairs white? Her mother replied, Well, every time you do something wrong and makes me sad or cry, one of my hairs turns white. The little girl thought about that a little while and was pondering on it and finally she asked her mom again, Mommy, how come all of Grandma's hairs are white? Traits can get passed down from generation to generation. And so we have to be intentional about what we're passing to our kids and what we've learned from our parents. Moms are highly influential teachers and shapers of their kids. COVID-19 has presented a unique opportunity for moms. Time spent together is a key factor in how much influence a person can have over another's life. And moms and children, for the most part, have much more time spent together now than they did before. Because before, kids spent six, seven, eight hours a day at school, and now they're at home. Some of the moms who had to work outside the home are now working from home now. And so they're around their kids even more. And then all the extracurricular activities that take up our weeknights and our weekends are all canceled. So this is a stressor, uh, sometimes, to have all this extra time, but it's also this great silver lining opportunity this time that we didn't expect to spend with our kids and influence them to be the people that God has called them to be. As we weigh that, I want to dig a little deeper in what we mean by being a disciple. If we say that motherhood is disciple-making, it's important to understand what a disciple is. Uh, it's a little tricky to pin down sometimes because disciple is largely a churchy word. So we want to think about what it would mean outside that context. Uh, it can also be defined as a pupil or a student, but even that falls short because typically when a student enters a class, it's not with the express purpose for becoming like their teacher. They may aspire to be like their teacher, but that's not the goal per se. In ancient use outside the New Testament, discipleship described, it described what we would call being an apprentice. Now, even this is a little bit hard to uh, get our minds around because the typical way we train for a job now, usually there's some formal education. Uh, we may include an internship of some kind, although that's really just getting your feet wet. And then we enter the, largely just enter the workforce and are trained for a specific job by a person who maybe used to do it but doesn't anymore or maybe has never done it. And so this idea of being trained for a specific task by a person who is already a master is not something that we really experience. There are some uh, examples of this. Uh, in the medical community, you have a resident uh, who spends time doing that before they become a full doctor. I don't want to say a real doctor. Uh, teaching students also will shadow uh, a established teacher for a year in their student teaching, and so there's that. But this idea of intentional, long-term, directed training is the exception rather than the rule. And you most often find it in the trades, and something uh, that was a lot more prevalent in Jesus' time. And Jesus' earthly father, was a uh, Joseph, was a carpenter, and so apprenticeship was probably something that Jesus himself did as an apprentice to his uh, father, earthly father Joseph. And this learning took place by observing a fully trained craftsman and watching what he was doing. And then there would be listening to instruction. 
but mostly by doing, moving to simple to more difficult as skills develop, all under the watchful eye of a teacher. Those three things, observing an example, listening, and doing under the supervision of a teacher, that is real apprenticeship. And if we talk about a mother as a disciple maker, that's, that's where it really is at. Uh, setting an example. Uh, being able to instruct. And then helping our kids follow Jesus in the way that we ourselves do. The goal is to become like your teacher. Jesus says this in Luke 6.40. And then becoming like the teacher is the expected outcome not just for his disciples, but for anyone who's apprenticing, whether it's a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician, or anyone else now. He says a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So a mother can be a follower of Jesus who seeks to become like Jesus in her own character and life's purpose with the expectation that her children will imitate her as she imitates Christ. And so mother can, motherhood can be a microcosm of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the sense that a mom's most important job is to make sure that her children know who Jesus is, place their faith in him, that they love God and who are themselves becoming like Jesus in their character and life's purpose. There are factors which make this goal as a mom difficult. One of those things is mom guilt. Moms are always asking them, themselves, am I making the right decisions for my kids, for their health and for their education? Do I spend enough time with my kids? Do I cook enough nutritious food? Am I patient enough even when my kids are really, really annoying me? Is my home clean and organized enough to be a good environment for my children? Part of this guilt is induced by the urge to be a super mom. There's this pull to be that super mom, but we have to realize that all Jesus is calling moms to do is to be godly and to raise their kids to follow Jesus. Attempts to be a super mom can divert time, energy, and focus away from what really matters. This reminds me of a parable of the sower that Jesus tells. There's four different kinds of soil in which a sower plants seed. And the seed represents the word of God and the soil represents four different kinds of conditions of the human heart. And the third kind of soil is described as thorny or weedy. And it doesn't sprout or bear fruit because it is being choked. The ground can't adequately nourish both plants. Jesus' application of this kind of soil is as follows. He says, And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Simply put, there were distractions. Jesus' saying is, is that a person cannot wholeheartedly pursue following him if these things, other things, which is a very broad thing, take too much time, energy, and resources in my life. He's talking about the cares of this world, materialism, and just other things. This is a struggle for every Christian, really, staying focused on being who God has called us to be and not being consumed by less important things. For the mom, the desire to be a super mom can erode the focus on being a godly mom. And here's where we need to thread the needle here when it comes to mommy guilt and just really guilt for any Christian. There's a sense in which the Spirit convicts us when we're not following God in the way that we really should be. Holy Spirit can be like a GPS for Christian life. And if that's the case, 
we need to change what we're doing. But if it's a simply a matter of I am putting these expectations on myself and they're not coming from God or if I, there are other people putting expectations on me, that just needs to be ignored. I don't know what it means to be a mom, but I wonder if mom guilt comes in part from comparisons to other people. Social media distorts our view of reality because what we see of other people's lives is highly filtered. If I look on at my Facebook page, I may be seeing at most the very best 5% of a person's life. Probably a lot less. So measuring the whole of my life against the best 5% of theirs is inherently an unfair comparison. In fact, into this is the competition between mothers and dads, for that matter, as to whose kid is best based on whatever is important to them. And uh, social media and just any interaction can become a breeding ground for this sort of thing. I've always thought that this was weird, to be honest with you. I understand that kids like, parents like to brag about their kids, and that's normal and healthy, I suppose. But I wonder if it can become the first steps of a parenting competition. I was once asked by a mom with grown children when Micah started walking and when he was potty trained. And the only reason that she asked me this at all because she wanted to brag about how early her grown sons had walked and started potty training. I'm like, I don't know what this has to do with anything. They were, she was playing a game where mom is trying to force their kids into the very best students, athletes, musicians, or whatever, and that can distract moms from raising godly children. And to be quite honest, when I was, I was, this mom was saying all this, I'm like, I don't know necessarily if I want my children to grow up to be like yours anyway. So I have to be aware of distractions in um, distorting our view of reality on social media, trying to be perfect, being swayed by guilt, and being in competition with other people. Those things really are essential to anything that moms are doing as parents. The core of becoming Jesus' disciple is to love God and to love others. There's a clear intersection between God's love for us, a mother's love, and being sons and daughters of God that he's called us to be. A mother's love is, for most people, the closest we will have on earth with another human being to experiencing God's love. The kind of love that the Bible says that God has towards us is selfless and is sacrificial in nature. God demonstrates his love towards us in many, many ways, but the most significant is in Jesus' death and resurrection. And no human love can compare to this sacrifice that Jesus makes. But for most, the most giving and selfless human relationship we have is with our mom. And if you had to have a one-word instruction that summed up the entirety of the Christian life, it would be to love. To live selflessly, putting others ahead of yourselves and being willing to sacrifice what is in your best interest. Uh, to do what is in the best interest of others. Part of being loving, not just as within a, uh, a family as we know it, but within a church family, is to be sensitive to uh, where other people are at uh, on this day. On occasions like this, we celebrate um, these relationships, but it may not be a cause for that for some other people. We need to follow Paul's guidance in Romans when he says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. If we are empathetic, we realize that there are those women, for whoever reason, uh, haven't had children, and maybe that's the thing that they want most in the world, but it didn't happen. You probably know someone who is estranged from their child or their mother, so today is a reminder of the pain of a broken relationship. There are those who have lost their mothers, which makes today bittersweet. There are those who have uh, whose children have passed away, which is a, uh, the worst nightmare uh, come to life for a parent. And so we need to be aware 
and thoughtful uh, of those people uh, in our church family. Within Jesus' mission for Christians, which is to go and make disciples, there are two parts. The first is to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is just shorthand for the entirety of what it means to accept God's grace. People are made in God's image, uh, making us his children. We have all rebelled against God. Our Heavenly Father, which is called sin in this choice, disconnects us from God, creating a gap that we can't span with our own efforts. We can't earn God's favor once sin enters our life, and that really tells us about the seriousness of sin. And since we cannot bring ourselves back to God, God came to us by sending His Son Jesus to die on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Galatians 3.13 says this about Jesus' death on the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. God was willing to absorb the pain and shame and guilt of the cross in, in Jesus so that we could be set free from our sin and be declared guiltless. God raised him from the dead, giving us hope for each day in eternity. And I just want to share with you the conditions for accepting that gift of salvation. The first is trust in Jesus with the sin of our past and leading our present and with the hope of our future. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In that verse, he also talks about confession, which I sometimes also refer to as profession. Usually when we think of confession, we think of, uh, I've done something wrong, I did it. But that's not what uh, Paul is talking about here. We simply ask people to affirm that they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, echoing what Peter said uh, while Jesus was on earth. So beyond faith and confession, the third condition for accepting salvation is repentance, which means that we reorient our posture towards sin. We change our mind about sin, leading us to change our actions. This is called repentance, and it does certainly not complete it uh, before we accept grace, but the process begins. The final step is becoming one with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. Instead of being buried and raised from a literal grave, we are symbolically buried in water and raised from it. Peter says in his epistle, Baptism, which now corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, normally when we meet together physically, and we hope that is really, really soon, we offer an invitation each, um, each Sunday morning. And we have a baptistry ready so that it can happen when a person makes that decision. You may be thinking about that right now and waiting. And if you have, we uh, urge you to contact us and get more information about that. And if you, it's something you want to do to make arrangements for that. Uh, God loves us so much. And we don't need to spend eternity apart from him. And we not only love our moms, but we know our moms love us. So we want to say one last time a happy Mother's Day. And I hope you moms feel special because you are. Take care and God bless. Dear God, we thank you for today's message. We thank you for the opportunity to share the message of hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. Even during this time when we can't meet together in person. We also look forward to the day when we can once meet again together and worship together as a family in one place. Lord, as we close today, we just want to honor our mothers. We thank you that you share your love with us in a very special way through our mothers. We thank you for the way that they care for us and provide safety and comfort. We're thankful for the way that they always find a way to make us feel better when we're hurt or we're sad. Lord, we're thankful for how they've taught us lessons in your scripture. Now they taught us to, as, just as children, to pray. And Lord, we're thankful for the way that they protect us and stand up for us. 
But most of all, Father, we thank you that they continue to love us no matter what, no matter how bad things get, no matter what we've done. They never give up on us and never stop loving just as you continue to love us. Lord, we also thank you for the, the godly women that have touched our lives over the years in, in so many different ways. We've all had someone touch our lives in a way that demonstrates your unfailing love. Perhaps it was an aunt or a Sunday school teacher, maybe a sister, or maybe that friend the, of the family that took you to church. Or maybe it was a school lunch lady that gave you a little extra food because you were hungry and she knew how hungry you were that day. And as we close out today, we just ask that you continue to bless these women and bless the good work that they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.